A panel formed by three Japanese prefectures near Mount Fuji has created a regional evacuation plan for a possible violent eruption of the volcano. They predicted that up to 470,000 people might have to escape. The panel set up by the governments of Shizuoka, Yamanashi and Kanagawa prefectures approved the plan on Thursday. A massive Mount Fuji eruption could spew volcanic ash onto wide areas, including Tokyo and nearby prefectures. The plan calls for residents to take shelter in sturdy buildings if more than 30 centimeters of ash is projected to accumulate on the ground. 30 centimeters of volcanic ash could weigh up to 500 kilograms, heavy enough to cause wooden houses to cave in. This is the first time criterion of this kind has been incorporated into an evacuation plan in Japan. We have just shared basic concepts on cross-border evacuations. We will continue to shape concrete measures, such as designating shelters for residents from each municipality. The three prefectures will inform residents about the evacuation plan and hold drills in April or later. Company executives are getting ready to apply for a safety screening to restart a nuclear reactor in central Japan. It is one of the facilities that then Prime Minister Naoto Kan asked to be shut down two months after the Fukushima accident. NHK has learned that Chubu Electric Power Company is planning to file an application with the Nuclear Regulation Authority later this month. Operators are required to clear the government's safety guidelines before restarting reactors. The Hamaoka plant drew public attention in 2011 when Khan pointed out that the plant lies directly above the projected focus of a magnitude 8 earthquake that experts have long been warning about. So utility officials have been working to enhance the disaster resistance of the plant, including the the construction of a 22 meter high seawall. That's three meters higher than the largest possible tsunami projected by a government panel of experts. The officials hope to restart the plant's number four reactor once these additional measures are in place. After the Fukushima accident, the utility increased its thermal power generation, but rising fuel costs have brought financial difficulties. Analysts say it remains unclear whether the reactor will operate again because the utility also needs to win the approval of local governments. All of Japan's 48 commercial reactors currently remain offline. Japan's supplementary budget for fiscal 2013 has been enacted. The government is hoping the $54 billion budget will cushion the expected negative impact of the consumption tax hike in April. The bill was approved in the upper house with a majority vote by the ruling coalition and other parties. The economic measures include cash handouts for low-income earners, including families with small children. Support will also be given to evacuees of the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident so they can return to their homes. About one quarter of the budget, or $14 billion, is assigned to projects aimed at boosting Japan's global standing. That's in line with the government's growth plan. The projects include an improvement in infrastructure in preparation for the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo and those to promote research and development of innovative drugs. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was happy to see the smooth enactment of the bill in a time that he says is crucial in order to achieve a virtuous cycle for the economic recovery.
Now the government will work hard to swiftly implement the budget so that people in every corner of the nation can feel the benefits of economic recovery. Nearly three years have passed since a massive quake and tsunami devastated Japan's northeastern region. But the harmful effects are still spreading within coastal forests. Experts recently discovered the main cause for the death of plants there. NHK World's Kei Yamamatsu has more. Forest land stretches along the Pacific coast of Aomori Prefecture, northern Japan. It's been maintained by the government for 150 years to protect inland areas from strong wind, sand, and possible tsunami. During the 2011 tsunami, trees stopped a floating boat just before it smashed into a residential area. But the forests may no longer be able to protect residents. Koki Kimura is a forestry institute researcher in Aomori. He now finds many dead pine trees, which didn't occur months after tsunami struck the forest. The bark comes off easily when the tree is dead. You can't bring it back to life. This aerial photograph was taken one month after the tsunami. The forest is healthy and green. Only a part of it had been knocked down by the waves. However, a photograph taken in the following year showed large gray area of lighted trees. The affected forest land has now grown 10 times bigger, 134 hectares across the prefecture. The forest can't block tsunami anymore. Inland residents and farms are at risk of serious damage. To discover the mechanism of the plant death, Kimura simulated how tsunami soaked the forest soil. On the day, seawater once covered the entire area, then gradually receded. But Kimura's simulation revealed some seawater continued to cover low-lying land. Ocean salt blocked the absorption of water by tree roots, weakening the body. Kimura says that sick trees couldn't survive the following unusual hot, dry summer. The trees were weakened by tsunami and lost their leaves. That reduces their ability to photosynthesize enough energy to sustain themselves. The local government is planning to restore the forest as soon as possible to prepare for another disaster. But young pine trees need at least 20 years to grow enough to offer protection from tsunami. Effects from the 2011 disaster are still spreading within the environment, even nearly three years later. K. Yamamas, NHK World, Aomori. This country loves is declaring wars on things. The war on drugs, the war on terrorism, the war on Christmas, and the list goes on. But perhaps it's time we declared a war on a real threat that's ending the lives of millions of people around the globe cancer. See, earlier this week, the World Health Organization released its annual World Cancer Report, and its findings are harrowing, to say the least.
according to the report, over the next 20 years, cancer cases worldwide are predicted to rise by 57 percent, from 14 million diagnoses in 2012 to an estimated 22 million by 2032. With this kind of dramatic increase, it will be nearly impossible to treat our way out of the problem, and the only hope is to prevent future cases from occurring. Although the report notes that developing countries have been and will continue to be disproportionately affected by increased cancer rates, the rise in the deadly disease is by no means confined to the third world. Affluent lifestyles and their connection to tobacco and alcohol use, as well as the consumption of processed foods, are enormous contributors to the problem. In fact, the report notes that nearly half of all new cancer cases are preventable. Lung cancer, for example, which is largely associated with smoking, is the most commonly diagnosed cancer and is responsible for about 13% of all cases. But beyond the human decimation that this sickness is inflicting throughout the world, the economic burden is tremendous as well. In 2010, the disease cost the global economy an estimated $1.16 trillion. But it doesn't have to be this way. Because as we've seen time and time again, pharmaceutical companies continue to put profit above treatment. Take one of the more egregious cases in India, for example. Recently, Indian pharmaceutical company Notco was allowed to create a generic version of a kidney and liver cancer medicine known as Nexavir. See, Nexavir is created by a giant pharma company, Bayer, and costs around $69,000 for one year supply. With a per capita income of around $1,500, that's not exactly in the price range of most Indians, let alone Western citizens. So based on India's patent laws, the Indian courts granted Natco a license to make the generic version of the drug because no cheaper alternative existed. And this generic version only cost $177 for a year supply, a 97% discount from Bayer's version. As you can imagine, Bayer didn't take too kindly to the ruling. CEO Marjan Deckers even went as far as calling it theft. But he didn't stop there. When discussing if this development would affect the company's profit margin, Deckers said no, because we did not develop this product for the Indian market. Let's be honest. We developed this product for Western patients who can afford the product, quite honestly. Wow. Well, I can't agree with his honesty, as despicable and heartless as it may be, if this isn't stark enough evidence to show what Big Pharma's real motives are, I'm not sure what is. So, while we continue to waste trillions of dollars per year fighting terrorism, with the greatest minds in science researching better ways to kill people, there's a real threat that's being completely neglected. And it's not just cancer itself, it's a system that puts profit over people today at the waste isolation pilot plant known as WIP, east of Carlsbad. A truck caught fire nearly a half mile underground. Lauren Hansard went to Carlsbad today where they don't take these situations lightly. That's right. All of the workers underground were evacuated safely. Six workers were taken to this hospital in Carlsbad for smoke inhalation. Fortunately, no one was seriously injured, but it was enough to shut down the plant for the rest of the week. It happened around 11. A salt truck caught fire underground, forcing nearly 50 workers to evacuate. WIP spokesperson Roger Nelson says the fire was not near nuclear materials, but these situations can be very dangerous. I mean, these are... Uh, um, events that could potentially harm people, our workers, as well as it gives us a bad um, uh, reputation because we appear to have made a mistake. WIP is an expansive facility that disposes of radioactive materials from nuclear weapons. Nelson says they are not explosive, but... Inhalation is the primary hazard with, with uh, radioactive materials of this nature. Nelson says this is one of the most serious incidents since the plant opened in 1999. It is a serious incident and we're definitely going to take um, our time to understand why and how it happened and make sure that it never happens again. In Carlsbad, Lauren Hansard, KOBI Witness News 4. All WIP operations have stopped while investigators work to figure out what caused that fire. The workers who were checked out at the hospital have since been released.